Hello and welcome to Left Done Guy, the pro indie podcast for lefties. This is our Hollywood election special. We will be discussing the results from Thursday's election, where the SNP won the election at a canter, but fell tantalisingly short of an overall majority. I'm your host, David McClement, transmitting from the Blantyre Free State, and the only member of the Green Party that doesn't want to fight. Joining me is the eighth most electable SNP member in the West of Scotland, it's my guy's digital Michelangelo, Miss Deborah Torrent. Also joining us tonight, he likes to jet set between Dundee and Torrevieja. He's Falkirk's Pizza Hut Prince himself, it's the region your sociologist, Brian Stewart Finley. Welcome, guys. How are you doing? Hey! I'm so good, good thanks. To see you. How are you? Oh, it's been a tough one. <laughs> it's, it's, it was really well drawn out, wasn't it? The results. <laughs> I didn't realise how much I had held my breath until like, I woke up and I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> well, two days is a long time to hold your breath. <laughs> um, very, a very long time. <laughs> so, like I was saying, so we had the election on Thursday. The result kind of came in over Friday, Saturday. And the final score was SNP with 64 seats. That's an increase of one. Uh, the Tories were next with 31 seats, which was the same as what they picked up and took. 2016. Mm. Uh, Labour lost two seats and are now on 22 seats. Well, uh, the Green Party picked up two seats and are now on eight, and the Lib Dems yeah. a single seat and are now on four. So, what's your initial thoughts and feelings about the election, then, guys? Deborah, do you want to go first? Aye, sure. Um, I think that it was good, a <laughs> good result. Obviously, I'd uh, like to have got over that wee 65, but. Uh, I think it was a good campaign. Lots of good, exciting stuff came out in the manifesto. Just have to make sure it's delivered up upon, basically. I think the, the biggest surprise for me was the Greens. Like, they done so well. Like, mm -hmm. it's a surprise, but not a surprise, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm glad, I'm really glad that they got those seats. But I'm annoyed about that independent Green voice yeah. situation mm -hmm. in Glasgow. But I'm sure you guys can... Talk about that in better detail than me. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. That, aye, that annoyed me. But Willie Rennie, he's still there. Still there. <laughs> he's still there. Oh, he's going to need to get a bigger chair to sit on in the beach, or like a, a bigger haystack to climb up, or something. <laughs> God I bless. Heard him, I heard him saying one of the results was that he was planning to go skydiving. That's a like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was just like weather pulled off. Um, <laughs> And one of the journalists actually said they think well, he just uses elections to like, fill his bucket list to yeah. do things that he wants to do, which and I can't even think of a better reason than getting into politics, to be it's, honest. It's a good motivator. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Willie Rennie has just become a bit of a caricature as a as, as a politician, particularly when it comes out to election time. It's, uh, it's always interesting to see what he's getting up to. He seems to have embraced it. Yes, just... and he laughs about it. Mm-hmm. I just can't help but like him. Like, I don't necessarily like his politics or that. Yeah. He's, but I just, I think he's just a li dead likeable sort of character. Yeah. So, Brian, what, was your, <laughs> Brian, what was your initial thoughts on in the election? In the so, that was actually my preferred outcome, which is a little bit controversial. I didn't want the SNP to have an overall majority um, for a few reasons um, with... Um, relation to the budget's initial proposals in the last parliament, I think was quite concerning in a few areas. Um, but um, I was really happy that the Greens picked up seats. Um, I was a little disappointed with the, the situation, which I'm, I know we'll talk about in more detail. Glasgow, I thought, was a, a shoe-in for, for a second seat. And in the south of Scotland, I knew it was always going to be really tight. Um, but it was just, it was, you know, really, really close. And it's just a shame not to see Laura Moody in, in, in Parliament, I think should be a really good addition, plus uh, Kim Long in, in Glasgow too. But generally, I was really, really happy. I actually did definitely screamed when I found out that Maggie Chapman was elected because I'm up here in the in the northeast. And, uh, and I was really chuffed when Lorna Slater was elected, especially being the very last one that she done a little dance and I was just like that's great you know it, I think that was the best outcome and I, I was disappointed that the Tories didn't lose more seats but you know we, we can dive more into the, the details 
about the, the you know the, the sort of tactical voting and things like that but yeah. that was I think would have been a really good message as well that if you know because you know the the Tory comeback in 2016 um would have been good to see that getting you know cut down a little bit but unfortunately it did not. Okay since we kind of both sort of raised some of the issues with the Greens so maybe we should talk about mm-hmm. that first. So the Greens get an increase of two seats uh, personally I, I, although it's a good result by the end of it, I was a bit disappointed because yeah. certainly a lot of the polling was indicating that they might do more, although historically the Greens have tended to do better in the polls than the actual results. But certainly I thought they were going to pick up 10 seats yeah. and in the end they lost out on those last two seats, both in Glasgow and south of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. I thought double I thought double digits as well. I was yeah, I thought... really optimistic for them um, and Obviously, I um, was advocating both votes SNP, but if it, somebody was saying I'll be voting the Greens second list, I'd be like, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I spoke to quite a few people. I mean, I'm obviously, as was pointed out at the start, the Pete's, you know, Pizza Prince of Falkirk, um, <laughs> all my family and loads of friends down there. Um, and I was, you know, the, the day before the election, I actually contacted every single one of my friends and everyone that I had on my phone. And I was like, what are you thinking about doing? And they were all like, yeah, both sorts of SNP. And I was like, nah, mate, what you want to do is you want to do this. And of course, as far as I'm aware, most of them done that. And that might have helped contribute towards, you know, uh, the Greens picking up a seat in Central. So I was very happy with, with, with that one too, which is, which is first time in history. So that's good. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a good it was, one. It was the Greens' best ever result. Like they get seven mm-hmm. in two thousand and three, which sometimes I think people forget about that result. Yeah. Um, I forget that happened. And Central <laughs> was the only region I think that it hadn't picked up mm-hmm. a, a seat at, at any stage in the Parliament this year. Um, I was quite pleased to see Central. I'm a member of South Lanarkshire Greens, so although technically Blantyre is in Glasgow for some bizarre reason, <laughs> so weird. Um, yeah. The most of my branch is sort of based in Central, so really happy to see Gillian McKay get elected. Mm-hmm. That was good. Was there one that was a uh, 20%? You got a swing of 20% because I was watching it with my girlfriend, the results, and I went, oh, that's an amazing result for the Greens. And then the commentator said the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. well, was... In Glasgow, they get uh, something like 34,000 votes, mm-hmm. which... Wow. In almost any other election, I think they'll definitely be in the second seat. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. there, were nine, there were about 900 behind the Tories. If they just yeah. get slightly more, they would have gotten up last uh, seat. And it would have been great to see the Tories cut, particularly oh. in Glasgow. Um, I think, you know, like Kim Long versus, you know, a second Tory seat. I mean, it's just so frustrating. And, you know, like we're going to dial, delve into this independent green voice situation. Yeah, to push um, that just now then. Yeah, it was it's, duplicitous. Like that's the only word for it. It's duplicitous. Mm-hmm. It's duplicitous. It's and, and, yeah, it calculated and and you know and the fact that it was independent green voice and the first word they chose to describe themselves was organic. I was like, you're not really any <laughs> green issues if you think that that is you know the first word to sell yourself as being green. It was like green sort of boggle. They just picked out random yeah. sort of words that they associate with environmentalism, and yeah. because yeah, they went with the ind. Yeah, at the independent green voice that sat above the greens on the list, um, also, quite far yeah. up. Also, the logo had just green yeah. and big letters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the uh, leaf, yeah, it was just yeah. I don't sneaky. know how the Electoral Commission allowed them to get away with it. It, it was really clear what they were trying to do, which was just yeah. to votes away from the legitimate green party. Mm-hmm. And what was it? There was a 1,000 votes in it. Yeah, and, and they got... I think they got 2,200. 2, 2,000 votes, and it was just under the 1,000 that uh, we were short of in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for anybody that doesn't realise that Independent and Green Voice isn't like a green splinter group of some kind, which would, if they had a different take on certain green issues or differences with the mainstream Green Party in Scotland, that would be perfectly fine. But this is a party set up by a far-right unionist, a lot I'm not even going to see his name, but what you what you will know he's known by the name Manky Jacob. Um, <laughs> you know, he doesn't care about green politics. It was a very cynical no. move to do nothing more than confuse voters and damage the Green Party, which thanks yeah. to the Electoral Commission, it worked. It mm-hmm. cost us a seat. 
what do you, is there anything that can be done retrospectively? Like, can you lodge a complaint, the Green Party, or they could? I'm sure they could probably lodge a complaint. I'm not sure what practical difference that would make in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, on, on, on Twitter that Mark Mark Ruskell um has shared um a tweet that somebody had picked up and he had the, the number of votes and things like that and tagged the electoral commission in it. Mark Ruskell had tweeted about it and Patrick Harvey, Harvey had shared it. So I don't know. I'm assuming they're gonna, you know, what interventions they can do, I don't know, but perhaps mm-hmm. they want to make sure that, that can't happen again because that, you know, in future elections could be yeah. really problematic. Yeah, well. The list was long enough anyway. I mean oh. <laughs> Well, it's just, it was, and there was parties I'd never even heard of, you know, and, you know, you actually follow, we, you know, follow politics really closely, and it's like, what? <laughs> like, how many abolished parties was there for the, you know, how, you <laughs> think that they would, they would, people you just would, wanted to get to the top, to the list, was And you think, and you think, maybe you would just set up a WhatsApp chat with everybody that wants to get rid of Hollywood, because there's not that many, and just be like, <laughs> let's just do one ticket. You know, and maybe, you know, get a couple of thousand votes to make a point. But no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was uh, abolished the Scottish, Scot- Scottish Parliament Party. Mm-hmm. And then there was another abolished something else. Mm-hmm. I didn't and then quite... UKIP as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, UKIP as well. And the Reform Party, I didn't know they were still going. <laughs> They're still a thing. And you've got They're no still a there. Thing. <laughs> still a thing. <laughs> I've literally had you and I think I'm a, Is that Michelle uh, Ballantyne? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. A is bit it? of a anorak. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Just what mm-hmm. is that yeah. Called? The reform. Reform. Which <laughs> <It's> is <just> basically <laughs> the, the the Brexit party, isn't it? Yeah. More Brexit, I think, is what they're saying. <laughs> more yeah, <laughs> more Brexit. <laughs> we won't, we haven't Brexited enough. <laughs> Brexit plus. Brexit plus, yeah. Changing politics for good. That was there. Yeah, and apparently, I've seen um, Michelle Ballantyne speaking on that election special that interviewed George Galloway and, and whatever, um, and, and she just kept saying that we needed common sense in politics, yet provided absolutely no common sense <laughs> in any of the ideas or proposals that were putting forward. It, it was just, you know, because we need common sense in politics, and I don't think Michelle Ballantyne is the best person to be advocating for that. Well, she, she was a Tory hey. MSP, am I right? She was. Oh. She was the one that that was was uh, went viral after being really quite horrible about the um, two child cap and rape clause, um, oh. basically saying that she supported it and you know people you know basically didn't shouldn't have had children if they couldn't afford it. That was essentially the, the sort of tone of what she said and uh, yeah, common yeah. sense in politics. Oh, mm. I've just realised that she, it's not the woman from Dragons Den. It's no, an actual, it's not. Sorry, I thought it was one of those <laughs> no, celebrity no, no. endorsements. Sorry, oh, no. yeah. I know who she, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yes, I just stared at the picture for a very long time. And went, I don't think that's who I think it is. <laughs> um, what was the worst performing party? Do you think? Um, Lib Dems really because they were the own. Well, is it, well. It, it's statistically, it's the Labour Party, but because Anna Sowers liked by the votes, it doesn't seem to have been like, because apparently the Scottish Labour were going to do a lot worse, and because they only lost two seats, it's it's fine. It's fine. Which is a really <laughs> weird take. <laughs> and then uh, and then you've got the Lib Dems that, you know, kept four, they kept four of their constituency seats. Two of them were probably genuinely because they wanted to vote Lib Dem. The other two is just tactical vote central. You know, if you look at the, the uh, I mean, North East Fife has been tactical vote central since the mid 80s so you know it's always been either mm. the then SDP to Lib Dems and the SNP had it you know for, for Westminster for a little while and I know that constituency really well because that's where Glenn grew up and it's yeah so that's a tactical voting thing and then Edinburgh Western which is you know a good old friend Alex Cole Hamilton is again mm-hmm. tactical vote central so yeah it's a shame only having four seats in the parliament yet only two of them are actually wanted for their parties yeah Quite unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, that. It's, it's also in the position that if they lost those seats, mm-hmm. they probably they would never get them back because no. once they've lost, the sort of tactical aspect kind of goes out the window a bit. Yeah, I would say the I would say the Lib Dems it's probably the worst result out of, out of all the parties from the point of view. Although they only mm-hmm. lost one seat, that is twenty percent of their seats. 
and <laughs> they now don't qualify as party in the parliament. I know, and and the, so the Greens get privi- everyone. Sorry. What privilege? What privileges uh, do they lose then in Holyrood? Is it they I can't ask I questions? Think, or? I think mm-hmm. it's um, some committees they lose representation mm-hmm. on to right. the, the mm-hmm. business of the parliament. Yeah. Um, I think they lose some rights at first minister's questions. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's other, or maybe some financial aspects. Uh, I don't know all the details, but I think it's just kind of a bit symbolic as well that you know, Lib Dems, the one of the sort of mainstays of UK politics now mm-hmm. is not even getting enough support to be considered a party in the Scottish Parliament. And if you yeah. look at the the results. They started out in 1999 with 17 MSPs. Mm-hmm. They retained 17 in 2003. They just dropped the one in 2007 to 16. And then 2011, they plummeted to five seats. Yes. And mm-hmm. they, they managed to retain them in 2016. And now, as we just said, the lost body was fine. Mm. Um, it's almost what happened in 2010 that could have caused that. I have no idea. I wonder. I <laughs> um, course, Nick Clegg. Was Nick Clegg. <laughs> dead with David Cameron. Mm-hmm. Um, politically speaking, we don't know if there was anything beyond that, but it's certainly looked yeah. like friendly. Yeah, uh, it sacrificed the students, didn't it? Yeah, yeah they did. It was tuition mm-hmm. fees in That's England like over a decade ago now, which is a bit yeah. scary, but also shows that the, the, the Scottish election <laughs> makes me feel old. Gone. No, gone and gone. I think it's um, going to be a long time and. For, for the Lib Dems. And even in, in the regionals here, most of the, the regions, the Greens bet the Lib Dems. So, you know, that kind of reflects the parliament, the way it stands at the moment, which is which is quite interesting and, and a really positive thing too. Yeah, and some of the regions yes. are very poorly, like, if any, really get mm-hmm. close in some of the regions. Um, yeah. I think uh, Mid-Scotland and Fife, the Greens sort of just picked them. They, they came close, like within a mm-hmm. thousand votes or so, but I don't think they really get close in any other regions. I didn't look at them. I wasn't studying the Lib Dems. I was too busy obsessing about the Green vote most of the time. But, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I watched uh, Christine Jardine. Uh, she was oh. doing an interview and she was saying how Lib Dems are the party of community and mm-hmm. basically already setting up the council campaign because they always do well in the councils, the Lib Dems. Well, I think I spoke to you about this before. Um, yeah. The, the, I grew up in Cambridge Lang, and Rutherland and Cambridge Lang always had quite a strong tradition. A, a Liberal Democrat, was always, they always got a lot of councillors around about there, which I thought was a Lanarkshire thing, but I've actually looked, and it turns out that's the only part of Lanarkshire they actually had any sort of representation. Mm-hmm. And they still, I think, I think they're just down to the one councillor now. It's Robert Brown, who's yeah. been an MSP on and off since the Parliament started. And that's a really local thing there in Brother Glen South with, with Robert Brown. And, um, you know, and he, you know, because I used to live in Brother Glen and, and stood for the Greens in, the, in that um, seat. And he he actually bet the SNP there. You know, he was the first one elected um, on the STV on, on first preference, if I remember correctly, um, which is, you know, obviously a very local thing. So he is the only Lib Dem that's, that's on South Lanarkshire. And you wonder whether when he retires, that Lib Dem vote yeah. will evaporate with. Uh, yeah, and maybe get a green oh. elected in there. You may, yeah, maybe, might have maybe. M- maybe a certain green. <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends if Brian moves back to Dundee or not. We'll <laughs> see. I'm moving back to the central belt, but I'm not sure, you know, exactly when. Who knows? Oh, coming home. <laughs> coming home. Back to South Lanarkshire tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I was glad to see uh, Ross Greer get on yeah he he's been a hard-working representative for the community increased he's a huge left as well yeah yeah he increased it in 2016 it was like seventeen thousand. like i think he just got in uh, i think it was mid twenty thousand they got now mm-hmm. yeah you know if you're looking to kick on at the next election you're maybe at one of the regions you're maybe saying well maybe we could sneak a second seat now if we kind of build on that uh, but yeah, it's a kind of safer seat than it certainly was in 2016 when it was first one. And it's a really good place for them to start building their vote now, I think, um, because they're represented in most regions um, apart from, from South. So it's a really good starting point for them, I think, maybe going into the, the uh, council elections and then on to any future sort of 
Scottish Parliament elections. It's, it's a really, really positive time for them, I think. And Lorna Slater's been amazing to raise the profile and, and tap into new voters, I think. So yeah. just got to build on that now, I think. Her interview on a trapeze was inspiring, <laughs> to be honest. I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I really dug it. <laughs> um, just talking about the South there, I always mm -hmm. thought that uh, the border uh, counties <laughs> were always Tory, but mm. I was looking at old maps uh, and they used to be red, a big red wall. And I was quite surprised oh, by that. <laughs> uh, I'm trying, let me see if I can find the tweet. I think it was... Uh, 87. It was before the Holyrood, obviously, but it mm. was it, it was a, a regional vote. Let me give me a minute. Use talk while okay. I go find this. Mm. I'd be quite surprised That's... to hear that because I've got a friend mm. from Galloway and he is the biggest, one of the biggest pro independent people I know. Uh, mm. And, you know, he's he resents the fact that his home sort of area is so staunchly Tory and um, one of the sort of landowners and farmers and that. that he, that you saw that. And, it's, and it's literally just like, you know, on the electoral map, it's like, you know, blue right across the border, which is really interesting. And it's almost like the SNP just starts above there and then just keeps going. It's really quite fascinating with a couple of wee specs in there, like, you know, Jackie Bailey's seat as well. Dum Dumbarton was a was, was obviously a one to watch and, and an exciting one to watch. And then it was just like, again, tactical voting central, you know, for, for, for the uh, on the unionist side, which was really interesting. Yeah. I didn't I didn't save it. I'm very silly, but that is the mm -hmm. image of oh it's not gonna show mm -hmm. of the blue wall. Yeah, like a little blue wall right along. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, look, I, I think it's more like the blue wellies at the bottom of sort of big yellow <laughs> big yellow raincoat that Scotland yeah. puts on every four years. Um so let's go on to talk about labour then. Um Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually, kind of similar to Lib Dems that, um, you know, they've declined in number of seats at every single Holyrood election. Mm -hmm. In 1999, they had 56, which uh, put them quite firmly in control of the parliament. So I just lost a few seats down to 50 in 2003. Then in 2007, they lost control of the parliament and they dropped down to 46 which put them one behind the SNP vote at that point. And then they dropped again in 2011 to 37, and then a big drop in 2016 down to 24. And it is kind of interesting that even though that was our worst ever result and they've lost another two seats on top of that, mm -hmm. you know, that the media seem to be convinced that Anis Sarwar has had a great result. Um, I find it quite baffling. It's... It's, it's a really weird, um, you know, because and, and the same can be said for Lib Dem as well, because it doesn't really get much coverage at all. But it's like those are the two parties that lost seats. Like, why is that not, you know, Labour declines, you know, again, is not the sort of narrative that comes out of this. It's just really interesting. But I think because they were polling so badly, you know, before Richard Leonard resigned, I think it was like 14 percent or something like that. And uh, so I think it was almost like, Oh, well, at least they didn't do terrible, which is a really interesting place for Scottish Labour to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even just, you know, six years on after they, you know, destroyed the, um, got, got destroyed in that 2015 general election. Yeah, yeah. And I'm shocked at how they're reporting the Labour result. Like, they mm. really are making out as if it's a wonderful result. But I think Anna Sarwar's maybe cost them some votes. I think Monica Lennon would have been a far yeah. better leader, just personally. <laughs> yeah, I just I, think she's so much more relatable. Yeah, I've never found Anna Sarwar to be very, come across as very likeable, to be quite honest. But I must admit, he did do well in the campaign. Mm -hmm. like, he he mm -hmm. came across as a lot more sort of personable and, and friendly and just kind of likeable. Um, I'd say I was quite shocked because I kind of disliked him before that. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's kind of rubbed off a bit in the, the sort of journalist's take on it, that he did have a good campaign, and even though it's not translated into a kind of positive yeah. result, you know, by giving him the benefit of the doubt for that. It reminds me a wee bit of uh, Annabelle Goldie, who, 
you know, was always always had good campaigns and always sort of seemed quite popular, but failed to move the sort of Tory vote at all much. It really was mm-hmm. quite stagnant. Um, so it'll buy him time, you know. You know, he seems to be in control with the party. It doesn't think the elements that undermined um, Richard Leonard or they seem quite supportive of mm-hmm. uh, Anasawa. I think um, with Anasawa, though, like right at the start of the, the campaign, like in these leaders' debates and when he was being interviewed, it was very, really refreshing because he, he wasn't, you know, going on the attack of the SNP constantly. It was more about this is what we need to do. This is what we need to change education and all these really important um, policy areas. And he, but I think by, by the time we got to the last leaders' debate, it was very much all of the same. And that sort of adult in the room approach just became yeah. really boring. That it was like, well, we know what Anna Sauer is going to say now. Well, you know, yeah. we need to really think about this, which is important stuff that he's talking about. But I think that if he had just been a little bit more feisty in certain aspects or, or you know, that, that type of thing. But I think it just became quite predictable by the end. And I think that's maybe where they polled quite, you know, decent, you know, near the start. And it just sort of drifted away by, by the end. That's just yeah. my, my sort of perception. Yeah, I think that the, the Channel 4 debate hurt them when the moderator said to them, well, if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine. You can sit it out. When mm-hmm. they're trying to say, we shouldn't be talking about indirect. Well, yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of people want to talk about indirect on both sides. Exactly. And, and again, it's a struggle to see how Labour are ever going to recover mm-hmm. uh, until independence is resolved. Because yeah. they keep trying to sit in the middle. They're trying to be unionists, but trying not to be too unionist. So they alienate all the pro-independent supporters, which is a lot of pro-independent Labour supporters. Mm-hmm. I, said, I read today... It was 40% a Labour voter. I mean, I did read it on Twitter, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, what was interesting is some of the results where the, the Greens stood in the constituencies, they seemed to be taking more votes from yes. Labour than they were the SNP. Yeah, um, I noticed that. Maybe tie into that. Do you think Labour have to not necessarily support independence, but be open to a referendum? Do you think that's yeah. something that would change their fortunes? I think that's all they need to do. Like Same. nobody, nobody's asking them to like, I don't know, like just completely change what they think. I mean, most of them, I mean, most of the elected members, or, or, or as far as I'm aware, don't you know, don't support independence. But they could just, you know, Monica Lennon's view. I think after the last general election was quite a good starting point for them to say, well, if the Scottish election, you know, electorate tell us we we want a referendum, we need to allow that to happen, and you know, and then. You know, and even just having an open view where you know any elected members or, or members of the Labour Party can campaign for whatever side they want. Yeah, I just think that 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 would be enough for people to think I'll give you my vote, you know, because I support your views on education and, and NHS and all these things. But actually, particularly that situation where they they removed the candidate in, in Glasgow, yeah, for for for, say, for actually having the same stance as what Monica Lennon had probably, in the leadership, you know. Yeah, I just think that that is a really bad message to send out to, to people like me, um, who, you know, as, as a green person, you know, would is more likely to vote Labour for their policies than the SNP for the policy. So if they're not closing that door on the constitution, then that's something that a lot of green voters and, and, and general lefty people would, would, would consider. It was terrible uh, what happened to Holly. She was a, a young woman, wasn't she? Mm-hmm, Getting mm-hmm. into politics. It's like... How to deter someone from trying to put themselves forward? It's terrible. And it was clear that they were making an example. They didn't mm-hmm. want other candidates to be saying things like that. You know, there was there was no need to sort of publicly sort of call her over the coals the way they did. It was shocking. Yeah, yeah. Labour's not very good for uh, having you know sort of amicable disagreements or, or you know throwing people under the bus to make a point Angela Rayner for example oh, um just... you know it's it's a really just it's just a really ridiculous approach to things isn't it you know let's make an example of one person so people don't act in a certain way or don't do certain things it's just ridiculous the sort of phenomenon that I mentioned there about the Greens potentially taking more votes from Labour in places than the SNP it actually reminds me Back when I was in the Scottish Socialist Party, we, the sort of, it was set up by former militant Labour members, and it was always this idea of that we would, it would keep Labour left, and it would take votes for Labour and force them to address, sort of, mm-hmm. and stay more socialistic. Uh, but actually, we found that where, where 
SSP candidates did. They helped the SNP more than they helped Labour. Mm-hmm. Um, there was an incident in, I think, up in Dundee. Uh, totally forgot the long-standing Labour MP's name at that time. Uh, but he was very sort of friendly towards the SSP. And the local branch took the decision not to stand mm-hmm. uh, because it was quite a marginal seat. And later analysing the election results, the fact that they didn't stand actually cost them a seat. Because if they had mm. stood, they would have probably took the votes from the, S- the SNP. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just quite, it's, it just shows you that politics doesn't always make sense and isn't logical. No. And mm, that's why you some... cannot tactical vote. <laughs> it's, it's exactly. Difficult. Do not try and game the system. You can't Don't, game the system. No. I agree with you. You should vote in good faith, vote for mm. the candidate you want, vote for whatever party you want on the list. Like, I just, that's why Al, Alba, I, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly uh, in the Gaelic way. I'm going to pronounce it how they launched it. Alba. Alba. With a hard, Alba with a hard B. Is, is, is that's that how what, they failed. I'm a bit confu- I've been a bit confused with that. Is that, is that the Gaelic pronunciation where I thought I'm more a P sound? Alba? Yeah. Right. Alba. I was getting really mixed up as to why people were saying it like that. And then I was just no, that's the remember, correct uh, pronunciation. Mm. Yes. <laughs> it's not like remember. BBC Alba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, or what's that footballer, Jordi Alba? Is yeah. that a footballer? Did I get yeah. a footballer? Yeah, I yeah. got a footballer's name. <laughs> that one. My girlfriend will be so proud. <laughs> Which I think his name would translate to George Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good name. It's a good name. <laughs> But the uh, but you know going back to to you know like politics is really unpredictable. I think that Joe Fitzpatrick being elected in Dundee West was such a huge thump in majority when he was actually the cabinet minister responsible for you know the whole drugs and then the really bad drug death rates that we had, and him being elected in Dundee, I actually found, felt myself really uncomfortable by seeing that. I, I don't know if it's just me that that kind of thinks like that, but I was like. You know, Dundee is historically bad, and still is bad for you know for for issues of addiction and and uh, poverty and for for unemployment and all these types of things, and and the drug death issue is huge, and I just thought, ah, oh, I don't know, I don't know if that's just me. No, you just you never know what what people are taking in, and when they're deciding to vote, what people are aware of, what people mm-hmm. care about. Um, yeah, you know, I'm always confused looking at some of the council election result when somebody drops out and their votes get reallocated and I've got mm-hmm. to say they're almost allocated randomly um, mm-hmm. you know you see like the Greens drop out and you say oh that they'll probably all go to the SNP and some of them do but some of them you get like three votes will go to the Tories and you think who's voting Green 1 and Tory 2 <laughs> <laughs> they vote and, yeah. SSP and then UKIP and you're like what? <laughs> is that just somebody going in and just randomly putting them boxes? Because there's as much logic there. Maybe they forgot their glasses and that's what's happened. And they're just putting numbers anywhere, you know. <laughs> that's your looking for logic again, though. <laughs> <laughs> True. There's no logic in yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I was uh, glad to see the Jada Franson woman get 47 votes. That was good. Yeah. And, and Nicola Sturgeon's really quite good speech and calling calling the spade a spade um which was really refreshing and you know really really positive and, and basically just calling out fascism and racism and i think it's really important for for you know really prominent politicians and and, and just just saying how it is and not doing a Keir Starmer where he was on LBC saying you know almost you know where there was somebody essentially saying very similar stuff to, to Keir Starmer on, on LBC last year um and you know, and just try to, you know, skirt around it and say, oh, I understand these are, you know, almost, we, we understand your valid concerns. Nah. nah. Fascism's not welcome. Racism's not welcome. And there's a note of unity. And I think, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, how you do it. So many mainstream politicians sort of panic in those situations yeah. and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. don't come out of it well. I, I don't know if it's because uh, so many of them are used to sort of controlled conditions that mm-hmm. something sort of random, like somebody accosting in the street, they just, they're not sure how to deal with that. Um, I think it probably helped. Nicola Sturgeon seemed to know who she was, which obviously yeah. helps. Um, but yeah, I mean, she dealt with it great, you know. 
pulled over. I thoroughly enjoyed the video. I thought it yeah. was wonderful. It was great. And, it, mm-hmm. and the councillor for Govan, he was mm-hmm. standing there. And I just liked how he kept putting the sign in front <laughs> there. It was so calm. It was just like that. It was like the was, new was that speak the to the man, hand. Was that the wee man that went, that's not true. I love him again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good on he's, he's a councillor in Govan. Uh, mm-hmm. he's, he's a good guy. But, yep. That should be our intro, by the way. I've done a wee thing for it. You're a fascist, you are a racist, and the south side of Glasgow will reject you. Yeah. And they did. <laughs> I, was, I was quite concerned when I seen it as well, because there didn't seem to be any security, but a lot of people were pointing out that the very large man hanging about <laughs> nearby was some kind of undercover security personnel. So. Uh, well, he was... Too bad he didn't he get was, involved. Even if he wasn't the security, he seemed big enough and doing the eyeballs, you know. Yes. Yeah. I don't think any... I think she's uh, quite savvy, though, our Nicola. She's, uh, she's she's bright. She's definitely mm-hmm. sharp. And she's, <laughs> she's on the ball. She knows exactly what she's doing. And yeah. uh, and it was it was just a really... Uh, could you, you know, I think it's just such a positive thing that the leader, you know, of, of the Scotland, you know, the First Minister... Just comes out and says that in the street to somebody who's, you know, clearly a racist and a fascist. Exactly. I love it. It's so good. I love it. <laughs> it, makes you, it makes you feel really proud to be Scottish because you know Absolutely. how that's going to be reported in other countries all around the world. And it sends out the message that, see, if you want to come here to our country, you're welcome here. I like that. And like yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, unless you're a fascist <laughs> or a racist. Yeah. The, um, but I love, you know, really, really positive and great. And and also the fact in Scotland that it was the first time that refugees were allowed to vote too, yep. um, which is, which is you know, quite poetic as well that, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in such a, a multicultural area like um, the south of Glasgow, I just think that it's just a really positive outcome to a really, you know. Yeah. Dramatic yeah, I, outcome I, I the day of the talking, election. I was talking to a guy in my work, he's from Cyprus, and mm-hmm. I was asking him, I was saying, uh, are, are you able to vote? And saying, because like, I know they've changed the rules, and pro- I don't think you're allowed to vote at Westminster, but you can in Scottish elections. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he was quite pleased with that, but he then went on to tell me that he'd never voted in his life, either in Scotland or in Cyprus. So it didn't make a difference to him, but still. Uh, so just for the record, let's just say that Jada Franson got 43 votes. 43. <laughs> that's really, that's unfortunate. It is. It's, it's unfortunate that 43 people wasted their vote on fascist. They and also, she, she would have been quite... How many of them forgot their glasses and thought they were voting for something else? <laughs> It's because they were wearing a mask and their glasses steamed up. That's what, that's what it is. That's exactly mm-hmm. what it is. And uh, I and, and thoroughly lost the deposit, which is nice. Yes, always nice. Mm-hmm. Who else lost their deposit? Did you think Family Party lost their deposit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. I d- d- they sure stood in a couple of constituencies actually, which I was going to say uh, that, did they? they did. Um, George Galloway. <sighs> yeah, mm-hmm. have you seen my cat? It's missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These guys would have lost it, wouldn't they? Reform, Reform, Reform. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And that other one that I've lost their leaflet. Ah. Yeah, the big egg. Big egg. Scottish family the... party. I've, I used to know a guy that apparently is now in the family party, and <laughs> he has got a machine rumored to have a machine in his living room that transmits um, some kind of special energy to him. Is it five so G? Case... <laughs> 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 uh, I can't remember the name of it, but um, if, I, if I remember, That's I'll, weird. I'll message it. Is it traditional yes, family values? <laughs> <laughs> traditional family values being right into your brain. Is that not what uh, they do in Scientology? Did they not have a, some sort of device in Scientology that does that? Tom Cruise. I just want to say, <laughs> just have a Tom Cruise. Listening, <laughs> that, uh, that is a personal view of Deborah. They're very litigious <laughs> to Scientology, so yeah. I'm saying nothing about them at all. That, that, um, yeah, wasn't, so, that wasn't derogatory. It was a genuine interest in de- about this device. I, I'm interested in buying one. Right, good pack, man. <laughs> um, yeah, so other fringe parties, Alba, sorry, Alpa, 
uh, all for unity. Yeah, none of them mm -hmm. really made much of an impression, except possibly the Alba picked up a few thousand votes in different regions, and who knows mm -hmm. how those votes sort of went and what differences they might have made if it went to SNP and Greens. Um, so if they did any effect that was negative, they certainly had a negative effect in the discourse where a lot of the trans yes. sort of yes. dog whistles were coming out for. Um, that's that's the that's their legacy as far as I'm concerned. That is uh, some of the things I didn't think we'd be discussing in an election in Scotland in 2021. It's things like ba let's ban conversion therapy. It's like wait, what? What is? Con what, what, <laughs> why is that happening? Why is then that you've debate, got you know exactly, mm -hmm. and then the whole trans rights things. It was just it was whipped up out of this absolute fabrication of just mm -hmm. shite, total yeah, bollocks, was, they were it was, saying. It was like Fox News where they, they create a hysteria mm -hmm. out of nothing mm -hmm. and convince people that there's, you know, barbarians at the gates and they're wearing dresses or something, you know, that's, or they're, I think the lead up to one of the congressional elections, they had half the electorate convinced that there was a, a caravan of refugees on its way, they smash through the border and invade. Mm -hmm. The day after the election, they just don't talk about it. It just apparently it just disappeared. That's right. <laughs> and that was the same tactics. It was the exact same tactics. Mm -hmm. It was Trumpian. It was just ah, oh, it was so frustrating. And just as a gay woman, I could see all those same things that you know. It was like, oh, mm -hmm. these are familiar. What? Oh, Very. I've heard this before. You know, people were saying it was like sort of repackaged homophobia, which, you know, to an extent it was, but they didn't even bother repackaging it. They just sort of just took it out, you know, wiped the dust off it and then just changed one word, you know, and just plonked it out. And the it's, it literally just got the tipex out and, and it's just so damaging. It's just, yeah, I've got so much I, I would like to say about it. But I just, it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's just so bad and just un unnecessary and, and targeting, you know, a really small minority of people. And it's just unacceptable. It really is. It really, it really angers me. And um, and that's one of the, the main reasons that, that I did I don't really engage in, in Twitter and stuff anymore. Because I just I just don't want to see it, you know. And uh, it's just it's just a shame that I love it, you know, not not so much officially in their campaign was, you know, it was never really mentioned by, you know, in the publications or anything like that. It was very much just a, a, a Twitter-based, um, you know, rabble and discussion and bullying and hatred. And it's just, it just has no place in political See, discourse. I would disagree with that because Alex mm. Salmon came out in defence of some of the stuff that their supporters were saying. So <sighs> I think it was a bit mainstream and their manifesto was littered with yes, you know we will rights. protect sex-based rights what is that what is a sex-based right gonna tell me <laughs> no idea <laughs> absolutely no idea but oh. to be fair i didn't i didn't watch any of alex salmon's <laughs> um <laughs> you know <laughs> um we just rants phase living room where podium just you know oh. chatting and, and you know try to make himself relevant but yeah it's just just minging yeah, if there's anything positive to come out of the album, it's the fact that they've drawn the poison out of a lot of the SNP. There was a lot yeah. of nasty people who were starting to get into kind of influential positions in the SNP. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the creation of the album's kind of drawn them out and sort of quarantined them. And mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, this epic failure in the election will just make them go away. Um, I don't know whether I will... They're all saying that they're going to continue and they're here for the long haul, mm -hmm. but that remains to be seen. Certainly next year, I look forward to seeing all the councillors that defected getting tossed out. Um, <laughs> and what? And Alib is saying that, that you know that you know if they, if they do continue, what are they going to do? Like stand to be councillors to try and bring about Endy from you know the the South Lanarkshire Council base in, in Hamilton. I mean, what? <laughs> like, is that is that the plan? <laughs> Well, their plan was whatever two MSPs they were going to get, uh, or 10, depending who you listen to, uh, they were going to... Oh, did you hear yeah. that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were so optimistic. The <laughs> right, well, they were going to be the kingmakers of the Scottish Parliament. Of course they were. Which, of course. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I 
I mean, I kind of still feel sorry for all the supporters that bought into it without really considering, well, there's already a viable alternative independent vote just right there. <laughs> yeah, but like, the, the, the line that I kept hearing from all the supporters were, well, the Greens don't really support independent. It's like, yeah. what, would you, what are you possibly basing that on? You know, it's... I keep hearing that oh, there's a lot of unionists in the games, but I've never met them. I've never met a single unionist, and I've been in I've the never party met a unionist. five years. I've heard yeah. stories about older members at some stage that weren't so sure in 2014. That was a long mm-hmm. time ago now, in politics. Yeah. Seven and years is a long time. Because uh, Lorna Slayer actually, I think, challenged that on I was watching one of the coverages and and she, you know they were saying oh it's like 43 percent of your you know green voters don't support independence and what she said was yeah that that was the Lord Ashcroft poll that looked at they had uh, used the data from constituency voters in uh, the Scottish Greens I think it was at a Westminster election so basically out of two or three seats so you know it was such a tiny um, sample that was just completely skewed. Um, but she did point to the, the actual regional constituent, uh, regional votes, um, and actually that's not the case. <laughs> so because okay. I, I don't know any of these unionist greens either. <laughs> and if you're a unionist and you you're into environmentalism and that's why you want to vote mm-hmm. for the greens and you hate independence, you'd think they would have changed their mind about voting green when we voted support through independence bills in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly like I know lots of Labour and Tories that were up my arms about that. If somehow the Greens were betraying their voters by, like, I'll just check my notes here, supporting a policy that they put in their <laughs> manifesto. Um, uh, uh, and if it was, if, if there really was this, this the phantom unionist Green voter, well, they wouldn't be for long if they really cared that much about unionism. Yeah, and and even if they were really were like, I love the Greens, but I don't support independence, then they would just vote no in the independence referendum. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, anyway. But also, of course, yeah. if, the, if the Greens don't really support independence, according to Alba, Nicola Sturgeon mm. is actually a secret oh, yeah. unionist spy. Is she yeah. not some, some sort of MI5? Half I mean, of honest, SMP fair, don't support it, uh, independence, according to Alba. So. If, <laughs> if if an MI5 are the reason for Nicola Sturgeon, I think we owe them a debt for what she's done for independence. I did, yeah. hear, I did hear a story one time from a friend that was in the Communist Party that said that they had a, a, a guy joined uh, the party and he was amazing. They said he was one of the best organisers of Phoenix set up this massive youth network in the Midlands. And then he vanished and they later found out that he was some kind of security service agent. And they all just mm. talked about how great it was and wished to come back. It was like, <laughs> okay, he was, all right, he was working for MI5, but what an organiser. Well, was... <laughs> so if Nicola Sturgeon's really worked for MI5, I would expect that they'll prove her quite soon because yeah. they can't be yeah. intending for her to actually it deliver it independence, surely. Would it not be really funny, though, if, if it was true, right? And then she, that picture got taken today and she was waving, going into Butte House, and then she just went in the door and then just was never seen again. I'd be sad about that. It would be really sad. <laughs> It'd be really sad, but it's like that would just be how that that would end. Thank you, the conspiracy theories. I know. That she just gets pulled, a, and that's it. That was a big thing this uh, election as well. Conspiracy theories. They, I have mm. never seen so many wild conspiracies in any election of you guys. Like some of them were absurd like there was conspiracy theories starting before the election had finished about mm-hmm. the count and yeah, stuff why the, why he's watching the, he's watching the he's watching the ballots yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I saw somebody tweet uh, sarcastically and a lot of people didn't seem to get the sarcasm well somebody said what's happening with the ballot and they responded saying it's ridiculous they're just leaving them in Turkey Hall Street they can't hear anything <laughs> And loads of people seem to take it seriously, which I really wonder about the mindset if you hear that and think, are they are they really just leaving the ballot box He's sitting in Sucky Hall Street? Surely <laughs> logic would dictate you would think, nah, that can't be true. That doesn't make any sense. 
<laughs> the yeah. one I liked was why are they why why are they not counting overnight like normal with all the counters? And it's like oh I don't know maybe this global <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> like, it was like recently in the last year that might have changed something. What could have changed this election? <laughs> I just don't understand. Um, I, there That's was... an achievement in itself. Actually, getting a record. A registration of voters, yes, record yeah. turnout of voters, and then awesome result for the SNP <laughs> and Greens. And, like and it's, Green. a good, uh, it's a good result in and the it, middle of a pandemic. No, That's, definitely. And I think um, as well they were saying uh, the, the, the sort of analysis was that was like, yeah, well, people might not have a lot of things going on at the moment, and I was like, aye, but I don't know. It, I, what do you think? Do you think that's actually a, a thing? Like people have just been stuck at home, so they're like, oh, I'm going to follow politics and vote. Or do you think it's maybe a genuine turnout for the fact that this was such a big vote in terms of the constitution? I don't know that that's a very that. good I'm question. No, I, I, I have no explanation of why the turnout jumped so much. Um, I think yeah. it's a. I think it was reactionary. Personally, I think everybody's mm-hmm. fed up, sick to the back teeth. Seen what's going on mm-hmm. down in uh, Bonnie Westminster. Mm-hmm. What's happening? Sort of didn't a, <laughs> so, do you think it's a sort of Brexit Boris sort of reaction? Ah, it's an accumulation of everything: the, the corruption, the, the mm-hmm. all the dodgy deals, all the mismanagement. Uh, what was going on with you know coronavirus when it first mm-hmm. came? And like, I think that it's definitely been a reactionary thing but I was worried that the turnout wouldn't be good because some folk would still be a bit worried like Mm -hmm. about going out to vote but Mm -hmm. it's it's astonishing what we actually achieved I think it's Mm -hmm. I think it's a great achievement (laughs) I know and I was shocked Mm -hmm. and it's a big jump and and for for the Scottish elections that's the highest ever right or it's Mm -hmm. yeah it's the highest ever which is which is amazing, considering it was so high. Um, but it's, it's so difficult because you, you don't know the reasons, you know, the actual reasons for everybody going out and voting. But like you say, it could be because <laughs> what's going on down in London? Um, where do you even start? Um, and then obviously the pandemic. And then it could be the fact that people have been following politics a bit more because they have been at home, you know? Um, <clears throat> I know that from when, you know, um, so part of my research and stuff from a PhD, um, and speaking to people that work in hospitality that have been off, you know, on, on furlough, have been a lot more engaged in politics because they've actually got the time. So there is some, perhaps some truth in that, the fact that people are just been following politics a bit more, getting more angry about it and wanting to 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 sort of, you know, vote to, to do that. Mm. Maybe also their lives have been impacted more yeah. by Directly. policy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that they've they've just got more engaged because they're like, this is terrible. How am I getting? How have I got to wait five weeks for my universal credit? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it could just be it could be something as personal as that, or yeah, it could that's... be the bigger picture. But I think one thing that was clear from every single manifesto, and you guys are already all over it, was the cl- climate change, mm-hmm. yes, environmental issues. And I was so pleased to see that mm-hmm. so high on the agenda of everybody. Mm-hmm. I think that was telling. And the youth vote as well. Remember, mm-hmm. there was like, all oh, the 16, 17-year-olds got to vote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the- that's true. Sometimes I wonder we haven't voted at 18, but by the time people get to 18, some of that youthful enthusiasm for politics is sort of already yeah. fading. So maybe at 16, it's a better way of hooking people and getting people engaged in politics and they engaged. Something that the pandemic has made me think about as well is we get so used to picking politicians based on their politics and mostly their politics. But I think the pandemic showed us how important competence competent I know trying to say it again. <laughs> competence and Put your teeth back in. Competence. <laughs> how important competence is. Um you know and Boris was just not the man for this job. Like no. um, as much as nobody in Scotland really is a fan of Thatcher, you know at least she had a, a level of competence that I think she would have probably dealt with a oh. pandemic better than Boris is. Because Boris, I can't even deal with his in here. Here, never mind. Well, that, that yeah. That's controversial. It sounded almost like you were saying Margaret Thatcher wasn't that bad. Well, she's, she's not that bad now. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, it's not bad now. But no, like the competence level, and I think it's been quite interesting because, you know, the the, the polling of the, the uh, how they think they're doing well in the pandemic is so high for Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland and really, really low for, for Boris Johnson. Um, and it really comes down to, I think, how they communicate, how they, they appear to be competent, how they appear to be more cautious, they appear to be putting in a lot more stricter interventions. Um, and I think that it's all about, you know, appearance and, and how they come across and, you know, that, you know, is self-evident with Boris Johnson. Do you mm-hmm. think seeing Nicola Sturgeon on the TV every day, every day. Mm-hmm. made a difference to, mm-hmm. yeah, I think so. I think it's engaged a lot more people. Yeah, and yeah. I think as well, we, the, the feeling that Nicola Sturgeon cared a bit more about the pandemic and the effect of everyone and people, whereas it just seemed to be a hassle for Boris, something that he had to deal with because he was a Prime Minister, yeah. that he would rather build water. And constantly wheeling out all these different cabinet ministers every day. Just, you know, it's almost like, oh, well, it's pretty Patel's turn. Sorry, you've got to go and do it. And then, you know, and you're just getting the rotating between all these different cabinet um, ministers. And I don't think that that landed as well as what it did in Scotland because Nicholas Sturgeon was there, you know, six days a week. And then it was like Gene Freeman used to do Sunday or, you know, um, and I think that that worked really, really well because there was a, there was a consistency every day. And Nicholas Sturgeon was answering the questions that were put to her by the media clearly, honestly. And um, whereas, you know, all these media questions, if there were difficult questions for Boris Johnson, he was almost just affronted that he was being asked these difficult questions and it's almost like oh it's really tough just now we don't know what's going on but nobody really does but you should you know so it's mm-hmm. you know I think that that was definitely a contributing factor for, for Nicola Sturgeon's polling for, for how they think she's dealt with the pandemic. How do, how do you think this election was for the Scottish stories? Mm. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say really it's just basically more of the Me- same from 2016 isn't it? I just find uh, Douglas Ross so monotonous and Mm -hmm. predictable. You know what he's going to say. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. You just can't, (laughs) Paul. You can't. You just can't. (laughs) I mean, I think think it was an excellent result for them, which (laughs) both of these looked as if you you didn't want to say. (laughs) No, I don't don't want to say. I was just disappointed. 2016 was a great... (laughs) was well, the best ever result, I think. And the fact that they've managed mm. to retain that um, kind of really surprised me. I thought they were going to lose a lot of seats. Um, partly because uh, Douglas Ross was just like a clown. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I don't think he's going to be there much longer. The Tories are very unforgiving and leaders that they don't feel are cutting yeah, them Yeah, look at Jackson Carlo. I mean, that was like a coup that just happened within almost like days, wasn't it? It was like, it, oh, it things are not going well. He's gone. Oh, there's somebody standing and no one's challenging them. You know, and then all of a sudden he was the new leader. And, and yeah, I don't think he'll last much longer, to be honest. It was, but it was like who a, else is it going to be? Power. It was like a change in power in a sort of mafia family. Mm-hmm. It was like um, Jackson Kerlo got invited over for, for a coffee and ended up getting <laughs> executed. And he was gone. And the new guy was in place as if he'd always been in place. Yeah, it was it was really quite strange. And it was because Jackson Carlo was like the shortest leader, wasn't he? I, I don't know even how long it was, but it just seemed to to happen really quickly. There was no one challenging him and he was just it's reinstated as the, the new leader. And they thought, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's give it to the guy who is going to have two a dual mandate and be a linesman in football, because that's going to go down really, really well. If they had won, he'd also be first minister, so he'd have like four jobs. Four. Actual four <laughs> jobs. Quadruple you've threat. The, you've got to wonder the mindset of somebody that wants to be a referee and the leader of the Tories. That's that's somebody with a lot of self loathing, I think. That's somebody that wants to be hated. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's a bit of a strange one. But I don't I don't think he's gonna last much longer. I don't think he had a very good campaign at all. But like you said, it was a good result for them because they managed to maintain that lift in 2016. And you know, say what you want about Ruth Davidson, Baroness Davidson, as she'll be called. Um, that she was one of these people who was a clear communicator and not as monotonous as mm-hmm. uh, and and then managed to sort of distance herself from that, oh, I'm a horrible Tory, and dis- disengaged yeah. completely even though there were so many different times where it aligned too close to home, like where there was the confidence and supply deal with the DUP, you know, she managed to get 
oh, you know, she hid for days and days and then just sort of came out as if it never happened. <laughs> and, then, and then she was being interviewed in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh about it. And they asked her about it and she just walked away from the, the reporter. And I was like, does this, is this what we do? We just, just pretend the question wasn't asked. But, you know, she managed to, to distance herself from, from the Tories at Westminster and the fact she, that the she Tories had managed to keep it. She had a bit of gumption about her, didn't she, Ruth Davidson? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you I know, but is... I found her very unlikable, but at the same time, she did have personality. Um, mm, aye, that's personality is the word because Douglas Ross is like a damp paper towel that's mm-hmm. been sitting in the sink for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And when no you offense, go to pick no, it up, no it might... to any damp paper towels out there. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Like he's just there's nothing about the guy, and that was their that was their single policy for this election: stop another referendum. That was it. There was nothing else. They would talk talk about oh, we need to uh, give more money to healthcare, mental health. Oh no, that was Willie Rennie, wasn't it? Willie Rennie Willie. just went mental health. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't even find another policy on this. It's just Labour would rather work with SNP. Stop it this week and stop the referendum. Yeah. That's you've all that's love, on their leaflet. You've got to love the Tories who, all through the campaign, said, "Don't vote for the SNP." If you vote for the SNP, not the second referendum. And then as soon as the count is finished, they're like, "Well, just because people voted for the SNP, it doesn't mean they want a second <laughs> referendum." And and then yeah, Douglas Ross came out today on STV and said, yeah, it's out with the competence of, of the Scottish Parliament. And I was like, we've just been speaking about this on loop for the last, you know, the whole campaign. And now you're just like, yeah, but it's not within the competence. So that's not going to happen. But did you see what Gov said on Mar? Oh, let's go. <laughs> he is. Yeah. And it, apparently they're not going to take them to the, the um, Supreme Court, mm-hmm. uh, the SNP, the Scottish Government, to su- Supreme Court to challenge it, which... I think they won't do it because it's a really bad PR for them, but I don't know how it's going to pan out now. But I just want Sturgeon to come out and, you know, obviously we'll get the pandemic out of the way and then she can just go like, right, this is it. This is what's happening. And it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. I saw a good tweet uh, today that said, uh, Nicola Sturgeon says, uh, as soon as we're out of the uh, pandemic and lockdown, we're moving on with things, we'll have a referendum. And Boris Johnson is desperate to get out of a lockdown and move on with things. So it's kind of <laughs> stuck in a bit of a catch-22. Yes. So obviously the SNP get one, ex- one more seat than they want in 2016, which put them to within one uh, seat of a overall majority. Do you think, yeah. we'll, do you think we'll get in there F2 now? What's the plan? What's the strategy for that? Well, I was in the ungagged pools for the longest time since 2014 as the next referendum would be 2021. Obviously, that's not happening. (laughs) But my next uh, guesstimate is 2023, I think. We'll put it in at maybe the end of this year, starting next year, and then I'll go. Like, I don't see how the UK government can deny it. I mean... Britain's or, or the UK, whatever you want to call it, is already a laughing stock in the world. If Boris Johnson's then like, oh no, Scotland can't have another independence referendum, even though they've got this independence party majority. Oh, like it's going to people, he's going to have to relent. But the UK government is a government of like bureaucracy. That's how they run. So you've got to exhaust all that mm-hmm. bureaucracy to get what you want, basically. That's my there's opinion, a, anyway. 2023. As a sort of counterpoint, though, Boris Johnson and his merry band of Brexiteers don't seem to be bothered about being laughing stock. Oh, this so is true. I'm really not sure that <laughs> they seem kind of immune to the pressure that, you know, is likely to come. The pressure is likely to come to the international community in a certain, to a certain extent. But, you know... I don't think that means a jot to Boris and his pals. And mm, that's a fair point. <laughs> and, and telling the jocks they in their place will probably play very well with his court, the sort mm-hmm. of core Tory vote in England. So I, I don't really see where the pressure is coming to make Boris change his mind. And that's, that's what I'm worried about. And I've not heard anything for the SNP or, you know, what do we do if Boris does just dig his heels in and says, no. 
the, the, yeah, they basically said like no to you know some kind of wildcat referendum or, or a legal referendum or whatever you want to call it. And and basically, it seems that the only route that they want to go down or the initial route that they'll go down is the legal challenge. And I think that that is, I think that's where it's going to go. I don't know how far down that road it's going to get because if the Scottish government says right, you know, if Boris Johnson says no and the Scottish government says well we've got a mandate to do it, we're going to start challenging this in court, then the UK government has to make a decision if they are going to challenge it to to a certain extent in the courts but every time the further and further that goes down the line and it just makes the UK government look really really unreasonable yeah. um, I think that it will actually be political pressure in that process that will will, will, um, will bring it around and there will be a legal referendum I think that because uh, you said 2023 and um, when is the next general election is it 2024 yes uh, yeah I think it will be that year do you Even yeah Okay, the sort of lead up to the yeah, I think that's what's going to happen, and I think that you know they're going to have to secure that before then. But I think for for, for the SNP, it would work really well actually if they said right, you know, say next year they, they start the process section twenty uh, section thirty order. Boris says no, back and forth, and then we go to start going down the legal route. They'll give in, um, and if the SNP were, were thinking about this and being quite clear about this, they could say right, we could have it in September twenty twenty four. General election will be in May. SNP gets an absolute stonker in, in Scotland again, which reinforces, right, this is it, it's on. Um, and I think that would be quite a good tactic for the SNP going into the start of a referendum campaign with, you know, you know 50 MPs or, or even more, or, you know, even doing another 2015 beforehand. And I think that that would um, put the SNP on a really good stance going into um, uh, a sort of yes, a, you know, a pro-independence campaign. You want to hear my plan? Go on. Right. Don't tell MD. It's a secret. <laughs> I think the SNP should use the fact that there's so many MPs down at Westminster. Now, just voting as a block, you know, doesn't really get us that far. But mm -hmm. if they just done a kind of all out direct action, disrupting everything they possibly can, you know, I don't know what procedural thing, but I am mm -hmm. talking, let's get like school kid level, start sticking chewing gum in the locks in the morning, <laughs> switch off the, 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 the <laughs> Wi-Fi routers, pull the fire alarm, just anything, just piss off every single member of parliament down there so they get to the point where they just go, I oh, just want to give them their, just want to give them their referendum. Let them get it's, it. Just this annoy is a really, them into it. That's my plan. It's a really good them. point because like it'll it. disrupt, <laughs> it'll just... It will disrupt democracy completely in England because they have, you know, had like any devolution, you know, their mayoral systems and that doesn't really deal with much. It would completely stop democracy in England if they kept doing that. And I think what they, they can do is they can keep trying to disrupt in ways like they've done before by saying, right, we want this house to sit in private. So it needs to be suspended. They need to go out, come back in, do all these different things. They can start doing direct action like that. And, uh, and it could be really problematic for um, procedural stuff to get through Parliament. See, I like it when they uh, break tradition and like yeah. don't don't do things they're meant to, or like touch things they're not meant to, like the big yeah. gold stick. I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm into that. I like David's plan. <laughs> yeah. Steal the big gold stick. Well, just run I, a bit with it. And I run think, the, I think the, the Scottish electorate would get behind them. The yeah, most, they would. The most <laughs> excited I've seen people about the SNP at Westminster was remember when um, they walked the speaker through. Ian Blackford out and, and they all mm -hmm. walked out. Yeah. I know loads of people that, that seem to think this is it, this is independence. Like I think <laughs> some people seem to <laughs> think that's what it looks that's like. It. That's it. We've just we've just decided we're away. <laughs> See you later. No, I think and it's true, and I think people really r relate to that because you know, Scotland and, and England and the rest of the UK, you know, are quite similar in a lot of ways, the way they view politics and certain things, right? One thing that Scotland is completely different about is about traditions, the British state, all these types, royal family, all these types of things, yeah. So when the, the SNP start disrupting Westminster or the House of Lords or whatever, however they mm -hmm. were able to do that, um, I think that that would have quite a widespread appeal and actually be like, okay, so, you know, you know, disobedience is on. Let's, let's start, you know, it would be great to start seeing that, but do I think it will happen straight away? I don't know. Not while they're yeah. sat at home on Zoom, <laughs> like, you know. Like, <laughs> it's true. I just don't know if the SNP will get it in them. Um, it's not really, a, I'm not meaning it's a criticism, criticism mm -hmm. but it's, 
Yeah, you do. They just, they just, <laughs> but, um, they're just kind of, they like to play within the lines. You know, they, they don't like breaking the rules. And I just, as much as I'm saying, I think that's what they should do, I honestly kind of see them going with it. I can see Mary Black getting involved, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> I was just that. Going. Yeah. But, but Ian Blackford and a lot of the other ones, I just, I think they care about being good parliamentarian. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think they've bought into some of the sort of traditions of Westminster, and I am just not sure I, I've got faith in a lot of them that they, they would be, to, be able to get talked into them, that kind of thing. But if any of the SNP parliamentarians are listening to this, then we <laughs> back you to, to start doing yep. this, these sort of disobedience stink things. Bones, and stink bones, the BAM. Stink. Grab the we'll stick. Call it, we'll um, call it the grand, the grand BAM up. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's what it will be known as. You should I like that. that. The BAM up strategy. <laughs> BAM yeah. up strategy. And Steal the try- stick. <laughs> Steal the stick because if, if the stick isn't in place, is that not because that's to represent the crown? Yeah, that if that's not in place, then the parliament can't. So I don't know how far you would get with a big stick, though. I don't think you would actually get out the no, the I actual... think the, the last time it got lifted off the, the desk uh-huh. in front of the speaker's box and turned round, that was that was as far as it got. <laughs> no, it was recently. Let me let me go. Yeah, it was quite recent, was quite a recent thing. That was during the, the sort of um, the prorogue of Parliament, wasn't it? When that happened. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I was, I'm, um, I'm talking about we. Well, it's, it's not called the stick. <laughs> there is a name for it. The mace. The mace. Government yeah, back, mace. Back in the 80s, Michael Heselstein, I don't even know what the debate was, but he basically he lost the plot and just lifted it up and started waving it like a storm. Uh, it was a Labour MP that removed it. Oh, was it? Is that right? Lloyd Russell Moyle grabbed the ceremonial oh. mace in protest at the government's handling of Brexit. Yeah. And it was a spur of the moment act. And I say more of that. It doesn't yeah. sound like a revolutionary though, does it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you should have ran a bit. No. <laughs> it's five have... foot. It's five foot. That's like uh, picking up Mama. Uh, That's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want to get very far. <laughs> and it's silver gilt. It must be heavy. Oh, no, wait, I know. I'm... I'm... I'm five foot three. That's just slightly smaller than me. Right. So there you go. So we need to figure who the figure out who the strongest SNP MP is, and then get <laughs> Chris Law. Chris Law is like Chris twelve foot. He's twelve foot high. I'm surprised. I'm <laughs> Wait, are you only? <laughs> are you only five foot three, Brian? Yes, That's I'm only five foot three. Two inches taller than Kylie Minogue. How amazing is that? Uh, you could be a pop star. You're absolutely <laughs> delighted with that, Brian. <laughs> absolutely. I'm delighted with that. <laughs> Who is the tallest MP we have? Is it Rhys Mogg? It's got to be in it. I don't know why. I'm always interested in people's heights. <laughs> <laughs> is Nicholas Soames still an MP? He was pretty, he looked pretty tall. Certainly pretty big. Was he? No, I think he, he, he stood down. Is that... um? Churchill's grandson or something. Mm-hmm, yeah. He stood down. He stood down at the general election. Was he a Tory? Yeah. He was a Tory. And uh, he blocked me on Twitter, yet I'd never ever spoken to him. Did you? Weird, <laughs> yeah. Did you ever hear the quote about him from his ex wife? No. Huh? Somebody was asked what it was like to speak with him, and she said, uh, Have you ever had a wardrobe following you with a key in the, the, the door? What? She said, having sex with them is like having a wardrobe fall on top of you with a key in the door. Oh. <laughs> it's a heterosexual thing, right? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> got there in the end. I was, I was so confused. I don't know if I've got much else to talk about. I'm really glad we ended up by or two blankly staring at me when I told my joke. <laughs> uh, please, please tell me this is a visual podcast because that was that's the best bit. <laughs> we're going to do. I think we're going to do a, a video recording and an audio rip also. But this Yay. has been very experimental, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. We have been gibbering for uh, a good couple of hours, by the way. Yeah. I don't know that. Wow. Huh? We need to ask the audience and listeners did you like this is this something you want to see more of 
or something you want to see less of or something you want to see with different people? <laughs> if, if you want to see it with different people, uh, keep that to yourself. <laughs> no, I'm talking about we can invite other people to join us. <laughs> so if the listeners or viewers or however you are letting this enter. Um, tweet us at, at underscore ungang. Um, you can find us on Facebook as well. And if you want to follow me at DaveOMac82, uh, and Deborah, you looking want to get any followers yes. out of this? I don't Shame mind. You can <laughs> follow me if you want. Uh, I'm Heath P. Picked. Brian, are you on, still on. are you still boycotting social media? Or? I am on I am on Twitter, but I'm private. But you can try and follow me, and I'll decide if I'm going to let you follow me or not. At we sociologist. Okay, everybody, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. So hopefully this will be the first of many. And thanks if there's anybody actually listening to this. So want to thank you for listening and. <laughs> Yes. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. 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 It's Scotsman, and I don't like my country being turned into another country by you. You're a fascist, you are a racist, and the south side of Glasgow will reject you. Jada Franson, Independent, 46. Nicola Ferguson Sturgeon, Scottish National Party, SNP, 19,735. And yesterday, not for the first time, the constituency was targeted by far-right thugs. Uh, the far-right thug who led that confrontation got 46 votes. And I am proud that once again, Glasgow Southside has shown the racists and the fascists that they are not welcome in Glasgow Southside, they are not welcome in Glasgow, and they are not welcome anywhere in Scotland. And let that be a note of unity.